This message today builds on the previous two sermons. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Light on the Rock, my friends and family and the Master. Let's ask Abba's blessing for Yeshua to join us. Dear Father in heaven, holy, holy, holy Father in heaven, and Yeshua who sits at your right hand, you who sit on the heavenly mercy seat, we come to you, dear Holy Father, knowing that you loved us and do still love us while knowing everything about us. Yeshua, the Lamb of God, wow, everything you have done for us. And Abba, our dear beloved Father, while we were still sinners, you sent him to die for us and you suffered every bit as much as he did. A father would, a loving father would. Father in heaven, bless this day. Bless the hearing of this message. You put your thoughts into the hearts and minds of those hearing it. Help us be filled with wonder, filled with the awe and deep respect of you and for you as we ponder something very special today. The joy that we can have of your salvation. The joy with you, by you, through you. Because of you, because of Yeshua, because of who and what you are, be with us. Be in our hearts and minds. Come join us. Pour your spirit on all who hear this. Thank you. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty holy name. Holy, 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 Father, we thank you. Amen. I suspect God's spirit may have brought you to this sermon on this day, because for many of you, it's about to change your entire life and your relationship with Abba and Yeshua if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. You may know I speak of God the Father by the name inspired even in the New Covenant, untranslated as Abba, Dear Father, Dear Pa, Daddy, Papa, okay? And Yeshua, which means salvation. I know it's a bold statement to say that you may have been brought to the sermon. Surprising even me to say that. But my heart was pushing me real hard to say it just now. Don't you just love it when you have your kids or grandkids around you and they're laughing and playing with you and they're enjoying you and you're enjoying them? And you maybe maybe you're telling them like I do the goofy bedtime stories or and they're laughing and they enjoy you and we play the game as I'm sure many of you do. I sure love you and they say I love you more, Poppy. And I say, Yeah, but I love you all the way to the moon and back and they'll say, I love you to the sun and back and we try to you know and we laugh and we hug and we tell these stories. I love it when I know they're in relationship with me and I am in relationship, good relationship with them. The same thing with your husband or your wife when everything's all right in my relationship with my wife. Life is good. There's a joy and it's fun when we're as one and in harmony, not so stressed out by work maybe, but we're laughing and having a good time in love. I love having a good time with my best friend, my wife, for 39 years. I love it when we're laughing together. I hate it when there's unhappiness or if she's feeling really like she's goofed up, something really messed up. Maybe she has, and that I'm unhappy with her. And so feeling I'm unhappy with her takes away her joy. I don't like that. So I have to assure her, come on, it's no big deal. Something like that happened, in fact, just today. And I had to call her back and say, hey, uh, it's all sorted out. Don't worry about it. And uh, made her try to make her feel good because I don't like it when my wife isn't happy. Joy is based on the quality of relationship in so many cases. Isn't God our Father the same? Does he really want you to come before him all the time in fear and trembling? Do you really think so? Some of you have never experienced the real joy of his presence, the real joy of his salvation, the real joy of it. 
joy when connected to people or even to God himself has everything to do with how you feel about the relationship. That relationship's the result of how we conduct ourselves with each other. If you feel loved and accepted and see what each is doing for the other and that you're being respectful of each other and what each one hopes, there's a joy when you think of that person or being. When you're working together, when you're kind to, to the relationship, when you're obedient to the relationship. <clears throat> None of us has even come close, though we may have the Holy Spirit. None of us has come close to the love the Father has for us. You know, parents will love their children far more than the children, even though they say they do, even could hope to attain. I mean, I know I have a deeper love for my children and my grandchildren than those six- and eight-year-olds and others could even possibly understand at this point, at that age. But they will grow in that love, and they will grow in it, and so will I. But I'm just saying a father's love is so much deeper, a mother's love even, perhaps even deeper yet. Anyway, but... um, Think of what Abba has done here. He knows everything about you and me. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he still loves you. And he still loves you and me. While we were yet sinners, he forgave us. Romans 5, I think it's verse 8. While the prodigal son's father saw the son a long ways off still, he must have been looking for him, The son, I mean the dad, I mean, who pictures God in the story, sprinted to his bad son, his prodigal son, sprinted. The Greek word there, ran, implies ran fast, ran hard. Sprinted to his son and was so glad to see him come back home again. That's in Luke 15, all those wonderful parables of Luke 15. One of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. The father ran to the son, in fact, before the father had even heard a single word of repentance, which the son had planned to say. He was just so happy to see him and joyful to have found him there alive and well. And he put on this big party. And no, I think the father's joy was greater than the joy of the prodigal son to come back home. I really do. I really, really do. There is a sentence in the Bible, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And that comes from Psalm 51, verse 12. A little past halfway through the very famous prayer of repentance of David, David, a man after God's own heart, knew joy. And what he was going through now was something he did not want one more minute of. King David had goofed up, super big time. He had killed someone's husband by his treacherous cover-up after he had forced the man's wife to his bed and gotten her pregnant. You know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? That's in 2 Samuel 11. If you're not familiar with it, go read it. And the subsequent confrontation in the next chapter, in 2 Samuel 12, of God's prophet Nathan, who came and told David this horrible story, horrifying story, this detestable story, of of the rich man who stole the one little lamb that uh, his poor neighbor had uh, so he could have something to feed a guest. Uh, I mean, the the rich man had had something, you know, some meat to feed the guest. He wouldn't take it from his own flock. David was incensed. That man must die. Nathan says his famous, you are that man. And you basically have all of these wives. He had at least eight or nine wives, and he had at least ten concubines that he left behind. In the Absalom Rebellion, so he probably had more. I mean, David had had a lot of hormones, and he had a lot of husbands. I mean, he had a lot of wives and concubines. Not husbands, but wives and concubines. (laughs) Anyway, in the midst of all of this is David's prayer of Psalm 51. He has this powerful line as he realizes he's lost that joy of salvation he once had. And his statement is where the title of this sermon comes from. Folks, the Bible nowhere, by the way puts any blame on Bathsheba. None. Get that out of your head if you're thinking it. Sure, she also committed adultery. Sure, both of them, according to Scripture, Leviticus 20.10, should have been stoned to death. Okay, Both the man and the woman. But in David's repentance, they were both forgiven. And and also, also keep in mind that the Bible puts the responsibility of this squarely upon David. And David says in Psalm 51, verses 11 and 12, I'll read from the Holman version, 
Psalm 51, verses 11 and 12. Read it in your Bible. Don't banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Take not thy spirit from me, okay? Restore to me the joy of your salvation and give me a willing spirit. Okay? Restore the joy of your salvation. Now, how about you? Are you brimming with joy of his salvation? Really? Let's phrase it another way. Are you overflowing with joy, knowing that you have been saved by the Son of God, by grace, through faith in Yeshua, as Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, and many other verses say? Do you ever even really think about having been saved? Do you? If not, you can't possibly be experiencing the joy. How is your relationship with your heavenly Abba, the great almighty God? How is your relationship with Yeshua? Uh, Most know him as Jesus. I want to ask because it's one full, uh, it's one full of joy. Uh, Is it one full of joy and is there happiness between you and God? Do you feel God Almighty is happy with you? How can you be happy in a relationship if you feel the other one is not happy with you? Are you happy about that relationship? Do you have the joy of salvation? Whenever anyone starts talking about being saved from sin and being rescued from being lost or away from God, do you well up inside full of joy? I dare say most of us Westerners do not. It might come a little easier for those from the Mediterranean countries or Middle Eastern countries. The Northern European countries tend to hold their emotions inside compared to Jews or Italians and Greeks, Spanish, for example. But over and over, both the Old and the New Testament speak of a joy we're supposed to have. A joy that's connected to salvation, our salvation, to being saved by Yeshua, by Jesus. A joy tied to our spiritual activities, to our relationship with God. Are you brimming with that joy? That's what we're talking about today, living in the joy of his salvation. For starters, let's make something clear. God Almighty is a very, very happy being. Now, I know, honestly, most of us don't see him that way, do we? Satan's done such a good job of painting him as a glued-to-the-chair kind of figure with a big frown on his face. Question. In your heart of hearts, what do you think Abba, our dear Heavenly Father, is really like? Do you see him as often laughing? Do you? Cheerful? Even at times funny? Would he be fun to be around? How do you see him? Is he sheer joy? Or is he boring? Let's be honest with how we see him. 1 Timothy 1.11 speaks of the glorious gospel, the good news, the glorious good news of the blessed God. The word for blessed there in the Greek is makarios, and it's usually translated blessed, but it has a deeper meaning of deep-seated, contented, peaceful joy. It's the same word for blessed that's used in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, and those kinds of things. Our God is, in other words, happy. Some translations will even translate it happy. Our God is a blessed God, or a very happy God. He's the happy God. Let that sink in. He wants you to be happy, too especially about being saved, about your salvation. How could we even be expected to be happy if the one who wants to spend eternity forever with you is unhappy, is an unhappy being, and is unhappy with you? Well, he isn't. He's a happy being. So start with a new picture of God our Father and his Son, who's a carbon copy of him, not a carbon copy, an express replica. Okay, you know him as Jesus. Start with a new picture that they are happy. They they are happy beings. David, a man after God's own heart, says this about being in God's presence. Okay, Psalm 1611. You can turn there if you like. Psalm 1611. Let me ask you, if I could say to you at the 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you're going to be in the presence of God Almighty, uh, what do you expect that to be like? David says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence 
is fullness of joy. Your right hand, at your right hand, are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures, joy. I mean, is that what we think of? Well, did, do you think of Abba the way David did? Fullness of joy? I suspect not. We've been told that God relishes somehow having his children appear before him, quote, with fear and trembling, because there are some verses that appear to say that. Isaiah 66, verse 2 is one. Isaiah 60, I want to talk about that for a second, the fear and trembling, because that, I think, takes away, uh, it seems to contradict this thing of, of sheer joy, fullness of joy. How can you have fullness of joy and fear and trembling going on at the same time? Isaiah 66, verse 2 says, To this man will I look, to him who's of a contrite heart. He's sorry, he's humbled, he's repentant. And he who trembles at my word. And who's the word of God, by the way? (laughs) Anyway, but he who trembles at my word. But in context, in context, if you read the next few verses after that, If you keep reading, God is actually castigating his people for making a show out of worship. They were mocking God, even as they appeared to be worshiping him, appeared to be religious. In that context, God is saying, come to me with a humble, repentant heart and show some respect for my word. That's what he's being, uh, that, that, this is being said to a very disrespectful nation at the time. But for all of those who are children of God, not rebellious sinners, who are children of God, he wants us coming boldly, without terror, and without fear, for perfect fear casts out love, it says in 1 John 4, verses 17 to 19. These aren't contradictions. Perfect love does cast out fear. I would never want my children or grandchildren literally quivering in fear in my presence. Never. Nor does God. To his children, for being in the presence of God is the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, as David said. You can't have fullness of joy and be literally trembling and terrored, can you? So there has to be something more to this. The phrase fear and trembling is often used in the Bible, so often that some have studied, who have studied the phrase fear and trembling, say it's actually an expression that was used and that referred more to having a feeling of awe and deep respect. They call it fear and trembling, but it meant fear, it meant awe and deep respect. Otherwise, some of the places where that phrase is used make little sense. I think there are also a few places where the phrase is used where it does make sense that a person literally was shaking. But when it's talking about the relationship we have, uh, let me show you one here. Psalm 2, verse 11. <clears throat> I'll show you several real quickly. The fact that we can read the phrase fear and trembling all through the Bible, I believe, shows it is an expression. Psalm 2, verse 11. Uh, Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. Now, how can you rejoice if you literally are so scared that you're shaking in your boots because you're so scared and so afraid. It would be ridiculous to expect rejoicing in the same breath as literal shaking. So maybe it's not literal shaking. For that matter, who among you ever trembles as you rejoice before your Maker? Who among you hearing this message can tell me that yes, when you pray, you're trembling before Him, literally quivering. It's what I thought, none of you. But ministers will preach this even though they themselves aren't doing it, and neither does it mean to literally tremble in fear. What David is saying is serve Yehovah, or Yahweh, I think I'm I'm leaning more to Yahweh now, with awe, rejoice with deep respect. Another example, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3 Paul is talking to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3, that he was with them in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. Again, that wasn't, couldn't be literal. The Paul I read about was not trembling in front of the Corinthians, though he was showing them a great deal of awe and respect when he first met with them. It was an expression. 
that I respected you, that I came there uh, respectful of you, your customs, who you are, and so forth. A couple more examples, 2 Corinthians 7, 5. Paul here, 2 Corinthians 7, 5. Paul here recounts how Titus was so impressed how the Corinthians received him, quote, with fear and trembling, end quote. All Paul is really saying is that they received him with profound respect. They were very respectful of him. It was an expression. And so that explains how in Philippians 2.12, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out means see it to the end, uh, with fear and trembling. Now, are you getting it? Salvation or being saved is joyous, we're told. And yet here in Philippians 2.12, it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so a lot of members, a lot of ministers focus on these verses. It does, and, But they don't read the next verse, like I've said so often in verse 13. Why are we to look at our salvation with such profound awe and respect or fear and trembling? For it is God, verse 13, Philippians 2, verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do. God is the one working in you. God is the one making you have the desire, the will, and the ability to do it. So Paul is saying, have deep respect for that kind of salvation because God himself is in you working it out. No wonder we're to look at our salvation with so much respect. God is the one bringing it about. He is the Savior. The Son of God is the Savior, according, to, and he is the one working in us. So is it any wonder that when we have misunderstandings, is it any wonder that, when, uh, that we aren't seeing more joy among God's people? Frankly, some of the most dour-looking people on the planet are church folks. Let's face it, I think, wouldn't you agree with me? Let's face it, they might light up when they see their friends coming, but do we light up the same way when we hear our sins are forgiven, we've been saved? Do we light up the same way as we sing the hymns? Do we know even, are we even conscious of the words, or we're really daydreaming about something else? The name Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew, is hardly even mentioned in some circles. Hardly even mentioned. Remember again, we're talking about the joy of salvation, not just joy per se. The joy of being saved. David wanted that joy restored. Now, part of the reason we're so dour is we tend to look, uh, we, we tend to like to beat up on ourselves and focus on the hard side of the Almighty. It's true, Romans 11.22 speaks of the goodness and the severity of God. We are promised his goodness, if we read the whole thing, of Romans 11.22 and 23. We are promised his goodness in that passage if we continue in his goodness. Otherwise, we can be cut off. Yes, that's there. And I have experienced some of that severity, but much more of his goodness. So I'm not preaching a cream-puffed God. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. But some of you can't experience the joy of salvation because your view of God just won't possibly allow it. So we need to learn from King David and others and pray for it to be given to us so we can start having it restored and experiencing it. There's a, a neat little verse in Nehemiah 12:43. The, the Jews under Nehemiah had just finished the wall. They were dedicating the wall. They were very, very excited about it, and uh, they felt God's blessing in it. Uh, Nehemiah 12, verse 43 <clears throat> It says, uh, they greatly rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. God had made them rejoice with great joy. And the joy of salvation is something that will come from God. And it says, the women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. There was so much joy and clapping and singing and dancing and shouting of joy that you could be a mile away and be hearing them. Okay, Nehemiah 12.43 was the one I just read. Also in Second Chronicles 30, at the end of the chapter, we have the, the, the Passover being kept by Hezekiah. He invited even the northern tribes to come down. Many of them did. Uh, many of the people did. And there was such great joy. And God heard it in heaven, it says. This is not the kind of joy you work up. Oh, i got to be more joyful or strive for. It's not the kind of thing that you might see posted on a pirate ship. You know, beatings will continue until morale improves. (laughs) But that's the way it feels sometimes. Like I'll hear sermons that we have to strive for this joy. This, This kind of joy is something you feel bubbling up inside when you understand what has just happened to you. 
Do you have to work up a feeling of joy when your home team scores a winning touchdown or goal? Or if you won a or got received a $25,000 bonus out of the blue, would you have to work up a feeling of joy? Or if you had been on death row and condemned to die, and now someone says, you know what, all the charges have been dropped, though you were guilty, someone will die for you. You might feel sad for the one who has to die for you, or you might be told someone already did die for you, and you no longer have to die. Would you have to strive for that joy? Now, it doesn't matter if you're a Tigger. Remember who Tigger is and Eeyore in the, in the, you know, in the, in the woods uh, stories and so on? Eeyore is this, uh, this uh, donkey that is always depressed. Tigger was his never, never, uh, you can never put down him, uh, his personality. The guy who bounces on his tail and all, you know. But anyway, this should be so exciting for whatever your personality is that you'd just be bubbling over, okay? Remember what Jesus said, that when the time comes to hand out the rewards, Matthew 25, 31, one of the things he says in Matthew 25, 31, I think again in verse 33, he says to the people who had doubled or, yeah, doubled their, their, um, the money that he had given them to work with and invest, he says to them, enter the joy of your Lord, of your Master. Enter the joy. The kingdom of God is joy. So whoever heard of working up happiness, striving for it, okay? Let's get back to King David again. Now, David was a man of great joy. Do you remember the story when God's ark, the ark of the tabernacle, was coming back to Jerusalem, the top of the hill there at Mount Zion? David was a man of deep passion and emotions and and it would just well up, and even you, you can read it in the Psalms. That he could be down, he could be up, but he could really praise God and had joy in that relationship. When the ark was being returned to the Mount Zion area, David kicked up his heels and really praised God in vigorous dance and praise, to the embarrassment of his wife. And that's all in Second Samuel six. Second Samuel six. But David danced before. Yahweh, with all his might, there was great joy, shouting, shofar blast, clapping, dancing, all of that going on. Great joy. I have a question for you and me. If you and I had been there that day, would we have spontaneously joined King David in the dancing, shouting, praising, or would we have taken a much more subdued, elegant approach? Honestly, what, what would you, knowing you, knowing how you see church, quote-unquote, worship, quote-unquote, would you have joined David in dancing and shouting for joy? Maybe clashing a couple cymbals together or blowing a shofar or something. Would you have joined him? You know your answer by what you do now. Many of you won't even express joy to Abba by so much as lifting your hands in prayer when there are so many examples in the Bible. Examples galore in all the Bible of that. So why would you and I think we dance or shout for this matter of raising holy hands in prayer? I'll give many scriptures in the notes. How about that? First Timothy 2.8. I think Paul says they're lifting holy hands, okay? In Psalm 28.2 and Psalm 134.2 and... Nehemiah lifted up his hands in prayer. King Solomon lifted his hands in prayer in dedicating the temple. Moses lifted up his hands in holding up the rod, among many, many more examples. So please, don't call it anything but biblical. After bringing up the Ark to Mount Zion, David then had a nonstop 24-7 music in his tabernacle of David on Mount Zion. He spoke of shouts of joy, clapping hands, dancing using all the instruments to display, display the joy he felt welling up inside. He was all heart. Psalm 5, verse 11 says, Let them shout for joy because you defend them. Psalm 32, 11. Shout for joy, all you upright. Psalm 32, 11. Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Do you and I have anywhere close to that kind of expression of joy? in our relationship with our God? Now here's a telltale question. Have you ever 
ever, even just one time, a single time, in worship, at home or at church, whether you're praying privately in your own room or whether you're in a, a, attending a church service, have you ever in your lifetime shouted out, Hallelujah! Ever. Ever. I just read to you three out of many, many, many verses that tell us to, but there will be ministers who are too dignified for that and who will label it protestant or Pentecostal or charismatic. Well, tell David that. No, no, let me change that. Tell God that. He's the one who inspired these verses to shout for joy, that shout for the rock of your salvation. Lift up your hands and worship him. Shout for joy. Clash on the cymbals. Dance and clap. And I mean, that, I know that's not what we're used to. There are some churches, some Protestant churches, who won't even play any music at all. And i got to say, you know, I've been in several Catholic masses in my lifetime. Not a lot, but several. I don't see that as a great time of great joy. Very, you know. Are you with me? Do you see what I'm saying? David, a man after God's own heart, said, Shout to the rock of your salvation. Anyway, David had this tremendous joy, and then he committed these series of horrible sins that robbed him and others of that joy that he once had, and they once had. It took him a while to come to his senses, maybe even years. But when Nathan the prophet confronted him, he acknowledged his sin, began to see how far he'd fallen. And the baby was not a baby anymore. It was a child. The Hebrew word there for child can mean all the way up to a young man. So he probably, the baby that was born out of wedlock or conceived out of wedlock, um, was probably at least three or four years old. Well, David had many big sins, many. But in God's eyes, the one big black stain on David's um, record, let's talk about David here just for a second, was this matter of Uriah. First Kings 15.5 says, David was a man after God's own heart and very pleasing to God, except in the matter of Uriah. First Kings 15, verse 5. Scripture does not say, by the way, it would be so much better for you if you would always print out the transcript and then hear the audio as well with the transcript in hand, uh, the notes in hand. Scripture does not say, except for the matter of Bathsheba. You know, we have all these titles of stories called David and Bathsheba. How about David and Uriah? That was the thing that really galled God. The first sin, the adultery, was one of hormones gone amok. David lusted. David gave in. He wasn't thinking with his head. And he sinned. That's all in Second Samuel 11. That sin resulted in a baby who had no sin. He didn't commit the sin. Uh, but the baby was conceived, and Bathsheba's husband ended up dead to try to cover up the sin. The baby grows and is described as a child, like I said, probably three or four years older now. The palace gossip, if they had Facebook, if they would have had Facebook back in those days, I'm telling you, it would have been going nuts. Everybody had heard about it, and God's name was being blasphemed. You know, if it, would, if it had happened today, there would be a video of it someplace with all these video cameras everywhere and people with their smartphones with videos. If it had happened today, someone would have had a video of it, and by now it would be, it would be on millions of views, and it, it would have gone viral. But for I'm just using that example. This was happening, but maybe not as dramatically as, as we do it today. But people knew. Stories were going. Gossip was going all over the place. In 2 Samuel 12, if you're not familiar with it, Nathan then confronts David with the story of the rich man I'd said earlier. And uh, you are that man who stole someone else's little lamb. David acknowledges his sin. I've sinned against Yehuah. But with consequences, the baby will now die seven days later. There would be infighting in his own household the rest of his life. And ten of his concubines would be ravished or raped on the palace roof where the whole sin began. Well, Bathsheba's father was Ahithophel. Ahithophel was a wise counselor. But he must have loved his little granddaughter and loved the husband that she had. It says that when he, was, when he had died, that Bathsheba, Bathsheba means daughter of the covenant. 
Bathsheba uh, actually mourned for her Baal, for her Lord, and uh, mourned quite a while. And then finally, when the mourning was over, David took her as his wife. But anyway, Ahithophel was so incensed by that, so upset by that, that he became hateful towards David and joined the David's son Absalom in a rebellion against David. And Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grandfather, even says he wants to kill David himself. Now that's pure hate at this point. This is what David's sin had caused. Second Samuel 17, verse 1 and 2. I will strike him. Second Samuel 17, 1 and 2. Anyway, all that mess with Uriah was indeed a mess. So after Nathan the prophet con- confronted David, he repented deeply, and his prayer is summarized for us in Psalm 51. But before we go into Psalm 51, I want to talk about this. What robs us of the joy? What robs us of our joy of salvation? True joy comes from the Holy Spirit. It's part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not one of the fruits. There are many gifts of the Spirit, but one fruit. We read the fruit, not fruits, of the Holy Spirit is. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit is. So then it lists the manifold Aspects of that one fruit of the Spirit summed up by love. Like an apple, we call it an apple, but it has a stem, has skin, it has the pulp, it has seeds, it has juice, and so on. But it's all an apple. The fruit of the Spirit is, remember that, joy is part of that fruit. So what robs us of our joy that we should be having? knowing that we've been saved. Well, what robs us joy often goes back to sin. Today we're not just talking about the joy in general, but specifically the joy of salvation, the joy of being saved from certain certain death, the second death because of our sins. Now what? Now what? Why don't we have more joy? Okay? Well, there's several reasons why we don't. Here's my first one. I don't think many of us really grasp what I've just said that you've been saved from certain death. Salvation that we can have after we first repent and accept Yeshua as our Savior can be, for many, just a doctrine. It's not a reality. It's just a doctrine for me for a while. Or if it was a reality, it became a doctrine later on at some point. You see, I'm giving this sermon because I need it as well. I want to learn more about this joy of salvation as well. I'm not saying I'm the big, perfect example of it. I'm not. But if we're trying to keep it as a doctrine and not a reality, you're not going to experience the joy. Until it becomes your reality, you won't have this joy. Many of us don't even realize we're lost and we're found. Oh, we've heard about it. We've sung about it. We kind of know it. But I ask, do you really realize how lost you were? How in need of a Savior we were? Stop for a second. Honestly ask yourself, did you really realize that? A person who knows he's truly lost and then is found before it's too late and had his life spared will experience ecstatic joy. I think this is a big key. I was hunting one time. I think I was about 17 years old. I'd gotten away from the party, the group I was with, and we're up in this mountain. And I just realized at some point, I have no idea where I am. Nowadays, when I go into woods, I mark my trail. So on my way back, I can, anyway, I I mark my trail now in different ways. But, I started to get very scared. The sun started going down, and I had no idea where camp was. I had no idea where I was. I don't know if I had a map. Now I always have maps and a compass and all that kind of stuff, whistles and all kinds of good stuff. And I knew I wasn't ready for nightfall. Nowadays I would be. How happy I was when I finally came to a road on the mountain, 
and someone drove by. I was so happy. I didn't even know this person. I just stood in the middle of the road and and asked them if they knew where Camp Sun So was or a certain location was, a short, short, certain store that I remembered seeing. Oh, yeah, it's down the road here. I'll take you to it. That was before cell phones. Of course, when I got to camp, I was 17 years old. I didn't tell everybody how happy I was because I was too cool, you know, to uh, <laughs> to say I was lost as can be. <laughs> but I was scared, and I was so happy when someone found me and they came along in that car and saved me. So let's understand, if we didn't repent, and if God didn't come looking for us and leading us to repentance, we would remain in a condemned state. And you hear me speak of Abba's abiding love, you must understand that his forgiving love is predicated on our repentance, on our accepting Yeshua, Jesus, as our Savior, changing our life direction, overcoming, fighting sin, resisting the devil, following Yeshua, or we die in our sins. Abba offered us a way out, and that way out is through Yeshua. There's no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. So let's not sugarcoat God. He is a loving God, but he's also a just God. He has laws, and the penalty of breaking any of his laws, even one time, if it's not repented of, is the second death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I'm not sugarcoating any of that. You were a condemned person once. Again, I think for many of us, it's just a doctrine. We haven't really let that sink in. And then Jesus, the awesome creator himself, the one who spoke all things into into existence except mankind, and with a human, he personally molded him. Everything else was spoken into existence. And so this creator became a human himself. And took all the condemnation, took all the wrath of God for sin upon himself. But we do have to repent. We do have to call on him. But that's why he came to earth, to save you. I've spoken several times also about the woman who came to Jesus while he was having lunch at a Pharisee's home. She's wept and she washed his feet with her tears. I've spoken on this many times recently. Yeshua acknowledged that she was a terrible sinner. He says in Luke 7, Luke 7, I think verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Someone who knows they've been forgiven a lot, he says, will love God a lot. Read this in Luke 7, verses 40 to 40, to, well, 40 to 50, let's say, Luke 7, especially verse 47. This lady no doubt left with a great peace and even joy for having been found. Even joy. In World War II, those who were in captivity or under bondage under the Nazis, when the Allies came through with the Americans and the Brits and everybody else that, who came through, the cities of Europe or Asia, for that matter, there was great joy in the streets. I've seen videos of it, it was before I was born. But they knew they were in bondage, and they knew that they were now being saved. And there was great joy. So the first point, why we don't have joy, why it's robbed, is because we look at it as a doctrine rather than as a reality. Second point, if we do realize we've been saved, then all too many ruin that joy they could have had by focusing on their failures, on their sins, their imperfections, their stumbles, rather than on the captain of our salvation. If you're looking at yourself, you're going to be joyless because we're flesh and blood. The spirit's willing, the flesh is weak, right? Somebody said that, right? Jesus said that. Keep your eyes on Yeshua, on Jesus, not on yourself. Too many feel, since they realize they still sin, they're imperfect, that God must be very unhappy with them. It's finding fault with them. So how can you possibly have the joy of salvation with those kind of thoughts? Yeah, we have a new nature given us by God, 
But that new nature is fighting the old nature that's still in us. Galatians 5, in the section about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, talks about these two war against each other in Galatians 5. One nature is fighting the other. When the old nature wins, we're winning and we're robbed of that joy. We're sinning is what I meant to say, not winning. We're sinning and we're robbed of that joy. When the new nature is winning, we're growing, we're overcoming, we're changing. We have that tremendous joy. But there is this fight going on. And like Paul said, who will deliver me from the bondage of this death? This wretched man that I am. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. What I'm getting at is this, because we all still have that old sinful nature. We will all still sometimes do what we don't want to do any longer. We don't want to lust, but we sometimes do. We don't want to hate, but we sometimes have to fight it. We don't want to covet. Sometimes we do. We don't want to gossip. Sometimes we do. And we repent of gossiping. We repent of lusting. Don't tell me that you never, ever, ever again will never lust. Never gossip. Never misuse your tongue. You know, there's a teaching out there that if you really repent, you'll never do that sin again. Really? Jesus said, if a person comes to you seven times in one day, and seven times says, I repent, you are to forgive him. How many times have you, in fact, been terribly sorry for something, but because you're flesh and blood, you still gossiped again, or you lied again, or you broke the Sabbath again? Abraham lied about his wife twice. Isaac did the same thing. But my point is, focus on the Savior, not on the sin. Do repent of the sin, yes. But do you know anyone who is right now without spot or wrinkle in their daily lives? Are they living permanently, perfectly, each and every moment? But are they children of God? Oh, yes. Are they saved by grace? Oh, yes. They received it. Do they still sometimes sin? Oh, yes. Do they want to sin? Oh, no. But we will continue to sometimes still sin all the way to the resurrection because that's when this corruption puts on incorruption. That is when we shall be like him and see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. So focus on the Savior more than you focus on the sin. Third point, many Christians who've accepted Christ um, don't really even believe that they have, in fact, been saved. Many of you out there believe that you have to wait till the resurrection before you can say you're saved. So if you don't know you're already saved, how can you be glad for having been already saved that you don't believe you have been saved? Okay, some of you are out there saying, well, wait a minute, doesn't it say that um, he who endures to the end shall be saved? I know those verses, brethren, I do. You can focus on those. But there are lots of verses also that talk about having been saved. There are lots of verses that talk about being saved. I'll leave those. I'll put those in the notes here for you to study. So those of you who believe you're not yet saved, hear me out here. I know know good and well. There's a good verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. I'll read it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. This is the gospel he preached, which also you received and in which you stand, and by which you are also saved. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you. So yes, there is a there is an element of holding fast to the end, enduring to the end. And the way I liken it, because there are lots of warnings, you know, don't be the seed like don't be like the seed falling in the rocks, it has no root and withers. Don't be like the man building a house upon the sand instead of the rock. Faith without works is dead unless it has works. 
Christ said it's not enough to do good works, but to preach his name, to cast out demons. Unless you obey him, he will say he never knew you. I preach. I know those verses too. But there are other verses you've got to look at as well, and we'll put it all together in a second here. 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 to 10. I'm cutting into the verse, the power of God who has saved us. 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. He saved us not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus and so on. Who has saved us. Ephesians 2, verse 5 and 8 speaks of by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay? By grace, by faith, I mean you have been saved. Okay? By grace and faith working together, you have been saved. Titus 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved, past tense, us. There's so many more I could use. Then there are other verses that talk about being saved. Acts 2.47, 1 Corinthians 1.18. And then there's some verses that talk about shall be saved. He who endures to the end shall be saved. And if we hold fast and so on. So I'm aware there's a future element. We have to hold fast. We have to endure. We have to overcome. But even before his death, Paul was sure that he had a crown of righteousness laid up for him, right? Before he died. He was sure of it. So putting all these thoughts together, here's how I explain it. If we continue to abide in Christ, if we continue to look to Yeshua and continue to trust in him, we can say we have been saved. Or else throw away all those verses like Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 8, and Titus 3, verse 5, and all the ones that I've just given you. If we continue to hang on to the vine, we will bear much fruit and be there at the end. So that's where the faith comes in. I want to illustrate it with somebody who maybe is out canoeing in a lake, and the canoe capsized, and he falls into the lake, and he doesn't have a life jacket on, foolish man. And doesn't know how to swim. Very foolish man. Out in the middle of the lake. And he's shouting and trying to stay above water, screaming, I can't swim. Someone help me, help me, help me. So somebody goes out in a boat to rescue him. And they come up to this man who can barely stay above water. He keeps diving down and so on. And someone throws him a lifeline. And on this lifeline is a a float, a a ring, you know. The man grabs the float, or the ring, and he puts it over his head and over his body, and now he's floating on the above the water. The rope is tied to the boat. The man in the boat is pulling the rope in. The man who was drowning is still in the water, but now he's hanging on to this rope and this life raft or life ring At that moment, the people on shore would be cheering. Some would be saying, oh, so great that he's been saved. Has he been saved? Yes. Absolutely yes. But he's still in the water. So if someone else would say, no, he's being saved, that's true too. Yep. And someone says, if he just won't let go of that rope and come out of that ring, so now he finally gets into the boat, has he been saved? Well, he's not on shore yet. The shore is kind of like the resurrection, okay, in some people's minds. So, yes, as long as we hang on to the salvation we've been offered, as long as we hang on to Yeshua, as long as we don't let go, okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 2, you know, if, if you endure to the end, if you abide in him, if you hang on to him, what does it say? If you hold fast, 1 Corinthians 15, 2. If you hold fast to the very end. So in that example, the man was in the water. He was still in the water. Someone threw him a rope with a life life ring on it. He gets in the life ring. He's now floating. He's now saved. But he's still in the water. He's being saved and he shall be saved. 
And I think that's the best way I know how to explain it. So I take it that if I abide in him and if I hold fast, I am saved. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 8, and so many other places. Titus 3, verse 5, who has saved us, and so on. Okay? But remember, your fears will come upon you. So if you really don't believe that you will be saved or you're worried about it, don't be like the man who took his talent or his money and buried it. Fear immobilized him. Some believe they were saved but will lose it, so they have no joy. Some feel that I'm being saved, but I just fail all the time. I sin all the time. So they have no joy. And they look at their sins instead of looking at their Savior. Those are the same people who focus on what they do instead of focusing on what Yeshua does and is doing. He is the Savior. He is the High Priest. You're not going to have this kind of joy of salvation while stewing and wondering if you're even saved yet. Okay? It's his salvation, by the way. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He is the Savior, not we ourselves. Savior is not... His, his, Savior is a title. It's, it's his title, not mine, not yours. And he's very good at saving. Very good. Yeshua was a friend of sinners, remember, so he, he covers us. We have a covering. He's a friend of sinners. So when you are a sinner, especially a repentant sinner, a repentant who is contrite and of a meek and contrite heart, seeking him like the public can be merciful to me, O God, a sinner. He's a friend of sinners. All right. You can quit cowering. He's not a friend of rebellious sinners who won't repent. But when a sinner does repent, God is so forgiving and so consoling. It's amazing, but don't take his mercy lightly either. Let him offer it to you and then learn to receive it. Finally, what can rob us of our joy, full joy, is focusing on the doctrine I said instead of the Savior. I say it this way, focusing on the event of being redeemed instead of the Redeemer, focusing on the event of being saved instead of on the Savior. I have a sermon in December 2011, I think it is, titled Yeshua Hiding in Plain Sight. If you haven't heard that, I recommend you do. There's almost 200 sermons on the website. And God's word, God's truth, it doesn't get old and stale. If you haven't heard them, there's 200 sermons and lots of blogs I recommend you listen to or, 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 or read. In there, in December 2011, I point out dozens of verses that use the word salvation the word being used in many of the cases is Strong's 3444. The very name of our Messiah, Yeshua, also means salvation. Other times it's a verb like Yesa or Yesha, but even those are related to Yeshua. But what's my point? Here it is. Where is our joy really placed? It's joyous enough when our joy is placed in the event of being saved. But I think it's far deeper, more real, when we come to know the one who saved us, whose name means Savior, salvation. I thought it was really cool, this 105-year-old man, I put it on my Facebook, had a surprise birthday party. He had saved, I think it was like 600 Jewish children in Czechoslovakia during the Nazi years. And now on his 105th birthday, someone had found them. Some list had been made. They found as many of these 600 they could. And without him knowing why, he was in this audience. First, they introduced, they introduced one lady sitting next to him as one of the little children he had saved. And he started to weep. Weep of joy. And then the... Uh, MC or the announcer said, now, is there anybody else in this room who owes your life to this man? Would you please stand? And it was very moving as he looked behind him and something like hundreds and hundreds of people stood up for this 105-year-old man. Okay? 
Yeshua's name is salvation. That's what his name means, Yeshua. And there are some who won't even name use the name Yeshua or Jesus very much. Here's some examples of what I'm talking about. Psalm 116, verse 13. Psalm 116, verse 13. I will take up the cup of Yeshua. Your Bible says salvation. <laughs> of course. I will take up the cup of Yeshua and call upon the name of Yahweh. Psalm 118, verses 14 and 15. These are the Psalms of Ascent when they would sing these even at Passover time or on the way to the feast. Psalm 118, verses 14 and 15. The voice of rejoicing and salvation and Yeshua is in the tents of the righteous. Psalm 119, verse 123. My eyes fail seeking for your Yeshua, for your salvation and your righteous word. Isaiah 25, verse 9. We will be glad and rejoice, that's joy there, in his Yeshua, in his salvation. Are you hearing it? Are you getting it? Restoring the joy of your salvation is really restoring your relationship with Yeshua. Okay, I hope you're getting that. I believe it's a type of denial of Yeshua himself, of denying Christ. Denying our Messiah when we deny, refuse, or won't accept him and the gifts he wants to give us. It's very insulting when you reject a gift from royalty. He wants to freely give us everything in fact. Returning to Romans 8, verses 29 to 33. And then the end of Romans 8 as well. Okay. Before we came to know, returning to Romans 8, before we came to know Yeshua, it was like we were walking in a really rough neighborhood, Satan's world, by ourselves. And we're just little boys or girls in my example. You're afraid. You're being bullied, taunted. You're being seduced. All the bad stuff's going on. You're being taken advantage of. And then out of nowhere comes along your big brother who's been looking for you. And he's big and he's strong. No one can take him on. And has and now he's found you and saved you. And he's one who's conquered everything and everyone. And he says, hey, kid, my brother, just walk with me. I've got your back. And from now on, you're with me. You're mine. You're in me. You're by me. And little brother, little sister, I can handle anything. I can handle anyone who comes our way as long as you hang on to me. Okay? Well, this is Yeshua. This is the Yeshua I know. He came along in the tough neighborhood. And he saved me. Because I was in trouble. I was a sinner. Bad sinner. By the way, so were you. But I see mine. So I love him very, very, very much. I hope you see yours so you can love him very much also. Romans 8, verses 29 to 33, For whom he foreknew, he predestined. Notice all the past tenses here. To be conformed, the past tense, to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those who he also called. But those he called, he justified, made righteous. And those he made righteous, justified, those he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all. Now listen to the wording here. Romans 8, verse 32. How shall he not with him? Remember, Yeshua says, walk with me. Walk beside me. Hang on. Stay with me, brother, sister. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How shall he not with us freely give us all things? Wow, 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 Yeshua. Wow, dear Hava, wow. Did you hear it? Did you hear that? Freely. 
with him, all things. The joy is not in just being saved, but that Abba has been, has been giving us a big brother who saves us, lives his life in us, and will see us to the very end. He who has begun a good work in you will not stop until he sees the whole thing done. And then the end of Romans 8 says, He who will, who will separate us from the love of Christ, verse 35. And then verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him. The glory, the focus, everything is on, Yeshua, is on Yeshua, is through him who loved us. I'm persuaded neither death nor life, angels, and so on and so on, will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, even when we sin. While we were yet sinners, he comes looking for the lost sheep of Luke 15, right? Go back to the stories of Luke 15. While that prodigal son had not said yet the words of repentance, but had just come home, he had changed his direction true. Father went running after him, falls upon him and kisses him and keeps kissing him is the, he, is the Greek there. Mm, 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 mm. So glad to see you. Oh, man, do you stink, though? Put a fresh robe on this man, because he's been wallowing in pigs, with pigs. But sandals, son, what are you doing in here looking like a servant, like a slave? He was going to say, let me be as one of your hired servants. Did you notice if you read the story in Luke 15, he never got a chance to say that part of it? Father interrupted him. He never got a chance to say that part. He did let him say that he repented. I've sinned against heaven and earth. No longer deserve to be your son. But then the father says, hey, hey, put, put a clean, fresh robe, the best robe on him. Put expensive sandals on his feet. The word there for sandals was the good, was the good sandals, the good quality sandals. He is not just a servant. He is my son. My son who was lost is alive again. Okay, so the joy of Yeshua is the joy of salvation. Coming to know Yeshua is where the true joy will be. If you get nothing else out of this sermon, this is the key. Coming to really come to know Yeshua. Not just salvation itself, but the name Yeshua. Come to know him. That's where your real joy will be. So we want to restore the joy of his Yeshua. Come to know that. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your Yeshua. So in Psalm 51, oh dear, you got to watch the time. So much more to cover. In Psalm 51, David begins with repentance. There can be no joy until the sin is repented of first and forgiven. But keep in mind, here, even, even here, God is the one who leads us to repentance. True repentance is not just admitting you did something wrong. He doesn't even mention Bathsheba in this prayer. He doesn't even mention Uriah in this prayer. He mentions who he is, what he is. He's a sinner. Sin is, what is, caused, sin is caused by what we are. Sin is caused by what we are. What are we? We're sinners. And again, he doesn't even mention the name Bathsheba. He doesn't even mention the name Uriah in here. Sinner, sin. We're all sinners. So real repentance is, sure, changing your direction, but it's also an admission of one's guilt. It's all of that. It's asking for forgiveness. It's expressing regret. It's all of that. Changing direction, but it's also admitting what you are. And you know what? It's going to be a lot harder to say, Father in heaven, forgive me, for I am a liar rather than saying, Father, forgive me, for I've lied. When you say, I am a liar, I don't want to be a liar anymore. I am an adulterer. I don't want to be an adulterer anymore. There's some things we don't even want to mention. They're so evil. They're so vile, so detestable. But when you can say privately before God, Father in heaven, I am a, and then whatever that detestable thing is, say it. I've had to. And it makes me love him even more. That I can come before holy, holy, holy God. Trice holy. And say, here's what I am. I don't want to be this anymore. I want to be holy too. I want to be clean. I want to be righteous. I want to be pleasing to you. And this is what David's prayer is all about. The first words are about God. 
and his faithful love and compassion. He says, be gracious to me, out of the Holman translation. God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion, my transgressions, my rebellion. The, Greek, the Hebrew there can mean rebellion. He focuses first on God's mercy. And then in the next few verses, he focuses on how bad he was. Wash me from my guilt, my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I'm conscious of my rebellion. My sin's always before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned. Done this evil in your sight. Ultimately, all sin is against God. He says, I was even guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans 5, verses 12 to 19, that by Adam's sin, all humanity was considered sinners. So repentance has to precede asking for restoration, which is what David does. Huge, huge point. True repentance and conversion is much more than just repenting the wrong of the wrong set of beliefs, like keeping Christmas, Easter, worshiping on Sunday instead of the seventh day, eating pork, stuff like that. Sure, it includes all that. But the biggest thing that we repent of is not a set of doctrines that we had wrong. No, the biggest thing we repent of is I am a sinner, Father, and I don't want to be that anymore. We repent of not being like God. We repent of what we are. What are we? God is the great I am. He is love, kindness. God says, I am goodness. I am the rock. I am faithful. I am true. What are we? Sometimes we have to come and say, Father, I'm a liar. That's harder to say than I lied. It's harder to say I'm a thief. I'm such a thief rather than say I didn't pay all my taxes. It's harder to say I'm so unfaithful in my heart at times rather than say, forgive me for looking at other women. I am so unfaithful, Father. I don't want to be that way anymore. I really don't. I want to be faithful like you. I don't want to be this way anymore. This is what David is doing here. True repentance is a lot more than just accepting a new set of beliefs, folks. It's, it's throwing out the old self. You want it thrown out, not overhauled, thrown out, replaced. There's nothing salvageable about it. That's why Paul says, there's nothing good in myself, in my flesh. In Romans 7, he says that. He says, purify me with hyssop. Hyssop was what they used to splash the blood on the door lintels and posts at the Passover. He's remembering the blood of the Lamb. Here in Psalm 51, verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me. You wash me. Hyssop. Picture is the cleansing from the blood of the Lamb of God. It was used also for rites of purification. When they had the blood of the red heifer mixed in with water and red wool and that kind of thing. Oh, man, oh, man. It's all in my notes here, too. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. I'm in verse 8 and 9, Psalm 51, verse 8 and 9. Turn your face from away from my sins. Blot out all my guilt. So far, he sounds very depressed, repentant, and joyless as he focuses now on himself and his sin. And so it should be when you first repent. It should be. Later on, you focus in your day-to-day walk on the Savior because what we believe is happening. You can have negative belief, but you can have positive belief in Yeshua. You can have positive belief that you're becoming righteous, and you will be more righteous than if you have positive belief that you're remaining a sinner. Put that sin behind you and put it behind you. Positive versus negative belief is so critical here to having the joy. And then in verse 10, Create a clean heart for me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. I don't want to be wishy-washy about obedience. Renew a steadfast spirit. You create in me a clean heart. You see, God is a creator. A clean heart comes from the the creator. He created the, the original creation, and he's creating the new creation. We're not the creators of the new creation. We're not. We're not. We're not. There's one, uh, there's one creator, and that's God. That's Abba. That's Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who created all things. Don't banish me from your presence, verse 11, or take your Holy Spirit from me. See, years had gone by. The Holy Spirit was not being stirred up. It was not being active. It's like water sitting in a bucket of, you know, in a bucket out in the hot sun. It'll begin to evaporate, begin to grow algae in there. 
and begin to not be very effective. But when water is moving and being used and being stirred up, it's powerful. It can, it can light up whole cities. It's clear that neither does Father instantly remove his spirit every time we sin, though. Otherwise, we would have none of the spirit much of the time. King Saul was given the Holy Spirit in 1 Samuel 10, verse 16. And then 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, six chapters later in the story, God removes his spirit from Saul because Saul was not stirring it up. And then he says in verse 12, Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Okay, and then in this joy of salvation, he now goes on to say that I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you in verse 13. All the way to 19, he says, in verse 14, Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, the God of my salvation, the God of my Yeshua, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness, not his own, of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You see, that's why it's got to be the righteousness of God that he gifts to us to cover us, as Paul so beautifully explains in Romans 5.17, in Philippians 3.9. I've spoken much about this. Jeremiah understood it, Jeremiah 33.16. He understood it was God's righteousness that stands. David understood it, Psalm 72.1, and many other verses that I have here. Abraham believed in it. Peter taught it, Second Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Certainly Paul taught it. Uh, the Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? How do we become the righteousness of God in him? Romans 5.17, he gives it to us as his gift. And we have to value that gift and walk with him and abide in him. My, my, the beauty is the joy of salvation in Hebrew. The joy of Yesha or Yeshua. It's a form of Yeshua. Restore to me that joy. And go back and read Luke 15. Go back and understand that every time the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son were found, there was great joy. There was a party thrown by the one who did the finding. And, and he, wanted to, he called the whole neighborhood over, share in my joy. And he said, there's great joy in heaven when you repent. And so feel that, see it, experience it. The woman at the well in John 4 Yeshua had sent the twelve disciples into town to get some food as he was tired and hungry. And he, he got such a kick out of inspiring this woman whose sins were many that he felt refreshed. And at some point, uh, he reveals himself to this woman as the Messiah, the sinful woman as the Messiah. One of the few people other than his twelve disciples who got to be told, I am that Messiah. What a beautiful story. She tells all the people in town, they come out and they love him, and he stays there two more days in the joy of their salvation. What a great time he has with them there in John 4. Look at, look at Luke 19, the first nine verses. The story of Zacchaeus. You know the story. The man who came down from, you know, he was a hated tax collector. Absolutely hated. And yet this man, this being who had breathed out the galaxies, who spoke the galaxies into existence, billions and billions and billions of stars, knew this man up in the tree by name and said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must come and stay with you and have lunch. And so this great creator basically tells the despised Zacchaeus that his creator knows him, loves him, hasn't given up on him, and wants for him to come to know the Savior. They have lunch. Zacchaeus is so touched and overjoyed that Yeshua said later, I think it's in verse 9 or 10, now has Yeshua, now has salvation come to this house. Brethren, I'm out of time. I wish I had more, much more time. I'm out of time. But please, please pray for this joy of salvation by focusing on the Savior. Uh, learn to sing. Learn to lift your hands in holy prayer. Learn to shout for joy. Learn to let it well up inside of you. Just come out. You don't have to strive to be joyful when you really understand how, what a lost saved sinner you were and how you have been saved by your Messiah. Religion, being saved, experiencing salvation, spirituality should all be so joyous to, to us. We must know we're being saved, have been saved. Focus on the one saving rather than just making it a doctrine. Then worship in joy. 
It's great realizing how joyful it is to be in the presence of your Savior. Let me know if you come to experience this joy. Father in heaven, thank you for who you are. Yeshua, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bring joy to all who hear this sermon. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen.